Uh, tonight I want you to open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and we will be in that passage in a few moments. Another personal anecdote, as many of you know, Lisa and I were in Montreal a few weeks ago where I conducted a funeral for a sister in Christ that we had known for many years who had asked me to return to Canada and do her funeral when the time came. She, she asked me when she was, I think, 86 or something like that. She said, you know, will you come do my funeral? You know, wherever you are in the world? I said, sure, I'll come back and do your funeral. Well, she, she lived till she was 99. She nearly outlived me, so uh, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was fine to go back there and do that. Her name was Helen, Helen LaChapelle, a wonderful sister in Christ. Even though Helen had been a faithful Christian, it struck me how her family and friends wanted reassurance that she was now safely in heaven. Even though we all knew she, you know, she was faithful to the end, praising God to the very end of her, very end of her days, the family that was there, they needed to know, are we sure she is there, is she okay? The experience of this funeral reminds um, me that uh, when death comes, as it so often comes into all of our lives, it makes our, our busy run around life and our planning and our building and our posturing all kinds of useless. <laughs> it just, it all stops, bang, like that. No, no need to plan over here or to switch that. Oh, I got to get my muffler changed. You know, all of that just stops instantly. It instantly becomes meaningless. When death comes, the, the only hope that we have uh, is not in the doctors or the, the technology or our wealth. When death comes, the only hope we have is in God. We see that especially at funerals. People who only go to a church building for perhaps a wedding or a funeral, that'll, that'll draw them. It's always a very sobering thought to them. There are many who desire and believe in, a, in an afterlife, but there are many who will hope so in vain. The only hope that will be realized is the hope centered in, in Jesus Christ. And in a way, it's a good thing we have funerals because we're able to remind people who never hear the gospel at a funeral, they get to hear that message that the hope is in Christ. And if the funeral is for a faithful Christian, they get to witness how Christians deal with the passing of a brother or, or sister in Christ. And the reason that we have hope, the reason that we can sing songs of joy at these occasions is because Jesus rose from the dead Himself and promised the same for all of his disciples. John chapter 6, verse 39. I've said this before, no other religion has a resurrected Savior as their leader. You can have a million people kneeling down and facing the east. You can have 100,000 men running around a piece of stone once a year. But none of them are worshiping and none of them can call on a leader in their religion that has risen from the dead. Only Christianity has that. And this hope is kindled in us, how? Well, through the gospel message. And it's kept alive in us as we continue to believe and proclaim this message of life and death and resurrection of Jesus. You know, one of the reasons for regular church attendance is that it is through this experience that we keep our faith, the flame, if you wish, of our faith nourished. And it is a way that we proclaim to the world that we believe and await the return of Jesus when we have communion, even if we don't say any words, that action proclaims that reality and that belief of ours to the world. While somebody else is polishing their car on Sunday morning in the driveway, as you drive by, and you know, I, it, <laughs> I see this in, in, in our neighborhood, neighbors are out there Sunday morning, you know, mow the lawn, do stuff, and they're in their you know, work pants and shorts and stuff like that. And Lisa and I, me with a jacket and a tie and carrying our Bibles and getting into the car, 
Yeah, I said, bye, see you, yeah, have a nice day, and they're waving away. And what do you think is going on in their minds? They know where we're going. I didn't say to them, Jesus is Lord and Jesus is risen from the dead, but they know that while we're piling into the car with our Bibles heading to church to have communion, they know what we are doing. We are making a witness, period, just by our action on Sunday mornings. The strength of our faith, the sureness of our hope, and consequently the degree of peace and joy that we experience because of this hope is directly related to how firmly we hold on to and we proclaim the message of the gospel. The more we believe, obey, and proclaim the gospel, the greater our joy and the greater our peace and the greater is our love for God and for one another, and especially for the lost. This idea is explained by Paul to the Corinthians, or to the Corinthian church. This group here was beginning to doubt the message and its effectiveness in changing their lives. And this doubt was being reflected in their lives through divisiveness, immoral living, and reliance on their own strength and wisdom to guide them. When Christians begin to practice immorality, usually it's because they're believing less in the message. If I start doubting the message, if I start doubting that resurrection, if I start doubting that the Bible is true, if I begin to doubt, the more I doubt, the better the world looks to me. And so in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 18 to 25, Paul the Apostle reestablishes the basis for true wisdom, the glasses through which they should look at the world so they could truly understand both life and death. And so the Corinthians came from a culture that prided itself on its ability to think, its wisdom. Corinth was an important seaport it was also the seat for the Roman governor in southern Greece. The city was wicked to the extent that in that particular culture to Corinthianize something meant to literally pervert it. If you were to pervert an idea or a thing, it was like you know, they would use the word, well, you've just Corinthianized that thing. The temple of Aphrodite stood 1,875 feet on the Corinthian Acropolis, overlooking the city of 500,000 Greeks, Romans, and Jews. The city of Corinth took pride in its philosophical heritage as well as its immoral sexual practices. Into this city, Paul established a church in the autumn of 50 AD while on his second missionary journey. And the church there prospered at first, but slowly began to deteriorate. And one of the major causes of this was the fact that they began to move away from the notion that the power to save man from sin and death, as well as the power to transform man, lay in the work of Christ on the cross, and the message of that power was the gospel itself. In other words, they began to think, really, is this gospel thing, is that a, I mean, is that a solid thing? Can we, can we base our life on that? Isn't there something better? Perhaps they thought they were smarter than God. Perhaps they thought they could improve it or change it or do away with it or accomplish the same things using different methods. Their efforts failed and as a consequence they were divided, they were immoral, they were confused about death and the resurrection. And so Paul begins by reestablishing the gospel as the basis for their thinking and he challenges what they see, what they were perceiving as wisdom. So there's a little setup there for you know, the passage that we're going to look at and we're going to jump in at verse 18. So read along with me, chapter one, verse 18. Paul says, 
For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so Paul says the gospel message seems like nonsense to one who doesn't believe it. I mean, think about it for a minute. It isn't logical that God becomes a man. Where's the logic in that? And it doesn't make sense that God would die and then resurrect. And it isn't wise to base your life now on what is going to happen after you die. Only fools do that. Conventional wisdom rejects the gospel of the cross. You know what? The gospel message has been preached for you know, 2,000 years, right? And it has stayed uh, vibrant for 2,000 years, but people continually being converted, churches continually being planted, millions and millions of people continually coming into Christianity, every generation, and yet on every news channel and on every news source that you can get on television, on radio, especially on the internet, is anyone reporting anything about the gospel of Jesus? <laughs> no. They only talk about it at, quote, Easter, and then they'll, they'll get some stock footage of the Pope blessing everybody in, in St. Peter's Square. That's about the only attention they pay to the gospel. And at Easter time, perhaps, I mean, the gospel, that's not a serious thing. A serious thing, European Parliament, oh, that's a serious thing. Yeah. yeah. A serious thing, oh, nuclear weapons, North, uh, North uh, Korea, oh, that's a serious, that's worth talking about. That's, that's going to have an effect on your life. The gospel? Jesus? Nah, we don't, we don't do that. We do real things. We don't do superstitions. I mean, we're like that today. Well, that's what was happening to them back then. And yet Paul says, this same message has the power to transform lives, the power to bring insight, the power to fill one with joy and hope and courage, even the power to die with courage for the one who believes the message. For the disbeliever, it is dismissed as foolishness but for the believer, it is the input that directly accesses the power of God filling his life. Now for these Corinthians, they had begun to disbelieve the message and they were in a mess as a result. So in verse 19, Paul continues, he says, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Here Paul quotes Isaiah the prophet to underline his point that this has always been a struggle for man in accepting God's wisdom over his own. He's saying this is nothing new, that man thinks that God's word is, you know, really has no power. This passage here that he quotes refers to a time during the reign of Hezekiah when Hezekiah's advisors were scheming and plotting to escape a Syrian attack without God's interference or help, they wanted the king to align himself with Egypt. They were saying to Hezekiah, well, don't, 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 you know, don't look for protection from God, from the Assyrians up north, a world power. Go and make an alliance with the Egyptian king and their army and they will protect us. In the quote, God says, he will save his people without these plans, but in his own way, with his power and his wisdom. And we read in 2 Kings 19.35, when Sennacherib and the Assyrian army attacked, God wiped out 185,000 of their soldiers in a single night using only one angel. The idea is that man's wisest plans are never any match for God's ways and God's means. Who would have thought, would have anyone have thought, how is God going to get us out of this mess with the Assyrians? Oh, I got it, he'll probably send one angel to destroy almost 200,000. Nobody would have thought of that. That wasn't a plan. In verse 20 he says, where is the wise man? 
Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? You know, Paul gives some examples that they may be familiar with this in this context. People who profess to be wise but were made to look foolish by God. Hmm. The wise men who guided the Assyrian kings and the pharaohs and all the enemies of God's people, he says. Where are these people now? Where are the Assyrians now? They're not, they're not, a, you know, they're not a factor anymore, they're gone. And the scribes who advised the Jewish kings, who plotted their own schemes to save the people without God's help. History shows how God brushed away their plans and instituted His own plan. And He's saying, where are these guys? Where are these wise people now and their plans? And the debaters and the philosophers of this age who offer their own ideas on the eternal questions and solutions to man's problem, how do they compare with God's revelation of the cross of Jesus Christ and the final solution that it brings? And did Nietzsche, the philosopher, come up with a better plan than the gospel? Any of the French philosophers? Any of the British philosophers? Any of them come up with a solution that is better than the gospel? That has not been replaced by someone else's you know, philosophy today? In every instance, has not God made man's most wise plans and ideas look foolish when his own ideas and wisdom were placed beside them? And so with all of this wisdom, man has failed in his most important task, and that is finding God and saving his soul. And so God, through a method which seems offensive to the Jews and foolish to the Greeks, has made himself known to man for his salvation. So we read back to the book, verse 21, he says, for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. In other words, man through his various plans, wisdom, ideas, could not even find God, let alone be saved. But God, however, through the method of preaching, not only reveals Himself to man, but saves him as well. Isn't that what Paul says in Romans 1.16? The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Paul establishes the idea that the power is in the message, not the messenger. This is contrary to human wisdom that puts so much importance on the messenger and his ability and his credentials, even what he looks like. <laughs> there was a, a photo spread about the Canadian Prime Minister, I'm not going to knock the Canadian Prime Minister, but what they talked about, you know what they talked about? His socks. <laughs> he was wearing the latest socks in men's fashion that he was cool looking, that he skis, that he snowboards. They were so in awe of his modernity. He just, he understood. He knows how to use the internet. He texts, he's cool. My only question is, how will he react if the Russians decide to cross over the north and attack Canada? We'll see how, what kind of socks he's wearing on that day. That's when a leader you know, <laughs> is tested through the fire. The fact of the matter is that it is the contents of the message, and I say this about, again, the prime minister Again, not wishing to disparage him, but it's the contents of his character that will decide what kind of man he is in the future, not what kind of socks he's wearing. The contents of the message that is important, regardless of who is speaking it. The announcement that God became man and died on the cross for men's sins, was resurrected three days later and offers all those who believe and are baptized in His name forgiveness and eternal life. This announcement, this good news, pierces men's hearts 
and changes them profoundly, no matter who is making the announcement. Whether the speaker is a Jew named Paul in the first century or an American from Canada named Michael in the 21st century makes absolutely no difference at all. And in this is seen the foolishness of men and the wisdom of God. That a Jew in the first century and an American slash Canadian preacher in the 21st century are speaking the exactly, exact same message to people and transforming their lives in exactly the same way. Who here, who here can come up with a wiser plan than that? In verse 22, Paul continues, he says, for, indeed, for indeed Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified to Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So for the Jews, the idea that their savior would die on a cross, that was distasteful. They saw the answer to their salvation in a mighty liberator who would free them from Roman domination and reestablish their glory days, like in the days of Solomon, not in a poor Nazarite nailed to a tree. They didn't see the need for anyone to die for their sins. They were children of Abraham. They were already acceptable to God by heritage. And if you don't believe that's true, I, I have had a discussion with a Jewish woman in Montreal. We happened to be talking about faith and so on and so forth. And you know, she was Jewish and she knew that I was a Christian preacher. And she said to me, I mean, it was right out of the book. She said to me, I don't need anybody to die for my sins. I said, really? Why? Because I don't have any, I obey the law. I mean, this, this, is, this was not in the first century. It's not some Pharisee here. This was a college educated Jewish woman living in Montreal, 20th century actually. I, it's when she said it. I had never heard anybody actually vocalize that idea. And she said it to me. I don't need your Jesus to die for my sins. I was like, <gasps> I get the idea of you know, tearing your shirt. Ah! <laughs> and the Greeks, well, they balked at the idea of bodily resurrection. They tried to create the new man through various philosophical systems each generation coming up with a new and better formula. Any talk of merely coming back from the dead without imperfections to live an eternal blissful life, that was foolishness. You people are nuts. And yet, for those among the Jews and Greeks who believe the message, the reality of God's forgiveness and His transforming power to change men and women could be experienced thus identifying to whom belong the true wisdom and the true power. Experience is the best proof. I don't know about you, but I am not the same man I was in 1979. And you would not recognize me if you met me in 1969. You certainly would not recognize me by my speech. That's for sure. For believers of the message, it was evident that what man considered foolish and powerless was indeed God's method of saving them. Well, things have not changed much since then. As we, you know, we're past the halfway mark of 2017, isn't that amazing? We're having the end of summer ice cream thing. The end of summer already. Thinking now about 2018. And yet, heading into the year 2018, people are still relying on a variety of ways to find God and save themselves and improve their lives. 
Some rely on technology and science to find a way for us to be happy and live eternally. You know, some radio stations, if you just have the right education, if we just educate people, they'll be okay. It'll be a utopia if we can just educate. Poor people, people on drugs, violent criminals, they just need more education. That's their solution. We have others you know, uh, who look within in order to find peace and balance with their universe. They think the, the answer is within. Just look into your heart. Just follow your heart. Find out who you are. Yes, sure. That'll be the answer. And then some, like the Jews, look for signs imposing ecclesiastic uh, organizations. You know, the bigger the church, the closer to God. Or they look for a millennium and an outward triumph of the gospel over the evil in the world as it exists. Yes, when good triumphs over evil in this world, not going to happen. Not going to happen. All the education and law enforcement in the world is not going to transform the evil world into a good world. Not going to happen, ever. All we do is mitigate. It's all we do. It's all we do. Mitigate. The religious people looking for any kind of sign where the supernatural is winning over the natural. It's not what Jesus taught us. And yet when the simple message is proclaimed, they scoff at this. Oh, it lacks evidence and basic uh, logic, say the inventors. Too simplistic, say the thinkers and the, the people who have uh, you know, the latest philosophy. Oh, it's too simple. What, what, you, you believe in Jesus? And you, you're baptized, you have a new life, you go to heaven forever, that it, that's it, too simple. Or perhaps not exciting enough or too plain and dull, reply the merchandisers of modern religion. But for those who have believed and repented and have been baptized, the gospel of the cross is the power that brings them into an intimate relationship with God and gives them strength for this life and hope for the next life. Hope for the next life. And, and that brings me full circle back to the beginning of my, of my lesson. The people at the funeral, many were not, never mind churchgoers, were not believers at all. And some who were nominal church goers of some religion or others, and then there were the, the brethren. One thing that was common to all these people as I spoke to them afterwards, hope. The non-believers wondered where she was. <laughs> and they said, well, I hope she'll be okay. And the believers, they knew where she was. And they knew that her hope had finally been realized. So I asked the question, which camp are you in this evening? Are you still looking towards something sensible, logical, technical, philosophical, emotional, to change or to save your soul? That's not where to look. Or are you ready to accept God's foolishness as the way to find peace and joy and hope, assurance of eternal life? As it was then and is now and will be until He returns, those who respond to God's foolishness will find the wisdom and the knowledge they have searched for and the answer to what they need. And so my appeal to you Become foolish, <laughs> become foolish. Accept the cross as your answer by repenting of your sins and being baptized today so you can see the wisdom of God in Christ. And for Christians, 
for Christians, and I believe most of us here are in that category, for Christians, please accept the cross as the ongoing payment for your sins as you confess them and abandon them and move on to greater service. I need the cross every single day because as I look to the cross every day in my prayers, I recognize that my salvation is there along with the sins that have been crucified there along with Christ. Every day I see it. Every day I'm thankful for it. It's the last image I wish to see in my own earthly life as I close my eyes and anticipate to open my eyes and see the living Lord before me and not the cross that He died on to save me. And so accept the cross for the ongoing payment for your sins as you confess them and abandon them and move on to greater service. And so if you have a response, I can't name every single thing that somebody might respond to. <laughs> Sometimes people say, well, he didn't mention my thing, so I guess I should just stay here in the pew. <laughs> but if you feel the need to respond in some way, it's okay. Send a card forward, come forward, talk to one of the elders, take a step forward in your faith. Whatever your needs. Uh, Johnny's got a song ready. I think we've already marked it in our books. Let's stand, let's sing that with all our hearts as we expect those who are to come forward to do that now.